Hi, uh, I'm Anwen Kafau and uh, uh, hello, my name is Tina Jacob. Together with Anwen, we are the teaching fellows in human bioarchaeology in this department, and we teach the study of human remains starting from undergraduate level one on to the MSc in paleopathology. So you might be wondering what human bioarchaeology actually is. Yes, this is something that we do get asked a lot. Uh, it, we basically, it's about the study of human remains in the past. So uh, we're trying to find out as much as we can about the lives of people in the past, uh, information that's captured in the bones and the skeletons of those people, um, which, you know, these are the remains of people who actually made the houses and the pots, etc. that we're studying. So they're direct evidence for life and health in the past. It's very important when we are studying human remains to remember that these are the remains of living people, people who were once alive. And it's important that we treat them with dignity and with respect and, and ethically. Yeah, so one of the things we would not want our students to do is, I don't know, put sunglasses on the skeletons or their jackets or play around with them. And it's also not advisable to take photographs of yourself with a skeleton and put them on social media. And this is one of the reasons when we you know, run laboratory classes, etc., it's very important that you know, food and drink is kept out of the labs, people wear lab coats um, to help protect the clothes as well as protect the skeletons, um, and that at all times people are taught how to handle the remains carefully over benches that are proper surfaces on them and um, that they're packed correctly that they take care with the handling and the packing etc uh, just to make sure that uh, the way the human remains are treated is is with care and dignity in your first year at university you will obviously get firstly the theoretical information about studying human remains but then there's also a huge practical aspect which is very important the real strength of the MSc course at Durham is that we have the uh, theoretical angle with the lectures etc but there's a very strong practical aspect as well so there are practical classes that run in conjunction with the lectures each week uh, where students will spend time in the lab uh, working through the themes that are introduced in the lectures so they get a real understanding um, of those methods through trying to apply them themselves and learning the limitations of those methods etc and they also have access to the lab um, outside of those classes, quite extensive access, and we expect them to come in and use the collections here so they have plenty of time to consolidate what they're learning and really learn um, the intricacies of the human skeleton, etc., which, which is what we want them to do. Well, obviously, the first important aspect you have to learn about when you study human remains is anatomy. So we want you to be able to recognize the most important bones, but also small fragments. And so, for example, in this person, you can see the ribs are actually very fragmentary. But with a bit of time and care, we can get them all back together. Um, this is an adult individual, so we will be looking for biological sex estimation. Yeah, so the two parts of the skeleton that we'd look for to assess sex would be the shape of the cranium. Uh, and also the shape of the pelvis. So in the cranium, um, this person doesn't have very pronounced muscle markings, so the back of the head is relatively smooth, which would indicate this is a female. Also, if we look at the mandible, kind of cressile, pointy chin, so again, female indicator, small mastoid processes, now we could argue about the brow ridges, they're slightly pronounced. A little bit. But yeah. not too much. So just looking at the skull, we would say this is a female, but obviously the pelvic area is a lot better for this kind of assessment. Yes, so um, the shape of the pelvis is very much linked to um, the fact that women have to give birth, so it's more tied into sex than the shape of the cranium. So you can see, for example, this is a very, very wide sciatic notch, um, the shape of the pubic area at the front, again, you've got this very wide angle here, which um, happens with females, uh, and you've got this ridge here called the ventral arc, which is again a strong uh, feature that you get with female skeletons. So overall, the shape of this uh, pelvis is very, very female, which uh, matches the information we're getting from the cranium. 
in terms of age estimation, again, we would be looking at the pelvic area. And this part is called the pubic symphysis. And you can see there's quite a lot of buildup on the margins. The surface is kind of smooth, which indicates that this was actually an elderly person. We can also look at changes that you find at the sternal ends of the ribs, which is at the front end of the ribs where they join the cartilage. Uh, and you can see that as people age, then the cartilage begins to ossify and you get uh, changes um, happening at these rib ends, which, which you can use to, to help uh, identify whether they're a younger or a, a middle-aged or an older person. Another important aspect is, of course, determining stature of a person, so how tall they were. Uh, obviously, if somebody is abnormally short or abnormally tall within their population, this would have implications. Uh, clearly, people of shorter stature tend to have childhood diseases or malnutrition. The next step would be looking for any uh, pathological lesions, trauma, any kind of changes which uh, help us to determine what this person sort of went through in their life. Uh, dental disease, obviously quite an important aspect. And in this case, you can see uh, one tooth has been lost during life. There's a tiny bit of a tooth root still stuck in the socket. Um, same on the other side where again we have lost a tooth during life. Uh, apart from that, this person was skeletally relatively healthy, so there is no joint degeneration, so no osteoarthritis, no fractures. So of course what with the skeleton all we can see are anything that's affected the actual skeleton itself. And because bone is constantly remodeling and turning over, it can capture information about uh, things that person has experienced in life. But obviously its ability to do that is fairly limited, uh, so some things um, will not affect the skeleton. So we can't tell, for example, whether this person had an injury that just affected the soft tissues. Uh, but we could, for example, if they'd fractured a bone, we would have been able to see that. These two bones are from the same person. These are the lower leg bones, the tibia and the fibula. And as you can see, um, you have quite a large amount of build-up of bone, but also some overlap. So this is a healed fracture occurring in both areas. It is well healed, but presumably this person would have had a shortened leg. Yeah, and I think you can see, if I turn it round, how the bone, the two halves, are no longer perfectly lined up. And you can see a bit of the, the overlap going on there. So obviously with both of these bones broken, um, they'd be, it would be harder to keep them both perfectly aligned for healing. If just one of them had broken, it would be easier to keep them in a, in a better alignment and you perhaps have achieved a better uh, state of healing. We've talked a little bit about healed trauma, so obviously if people have a fracture, the bone can heal itself. Um, but we can also see evidence sometimes of unhealed trauma or perimortem injuries, uh, where we don't see any evidence for healing on the bone. So what we tend to see in that, uh, uh, with that sort of uh, occasion is you get these very, very sharp edged, very, very smooth and polished bone surfaces where a sharp implement has cut into the bone. Now this could, for example, be something like a sword cut or, or something like that, but considering the position of this, this is kind of running just along above the orbit in a very, very straight horizontal line. This is more likely to be something like a craniotomy where someone's carried out a dissection and cut into the, the skull to open up uh, the cranium to see inside. But the character of the bone change is exactly what you'd see with a, with a perimortem sword injury. So if we see something like that, then we know that um, you're looking at something where the person's been, uh, hasn't survived their injuries or yeah. not survived But in this case, yeah. obviously, it would be very important to know about the context. Yes. So, for example, if this would be from the early medieval period, then an autopsy or a craniometry would not probably be 
the most likeliest explanation. Another area where we see quite a lot of evidence is joint disease because obviously um, that's something that tends to happen with advancing age and most or all skeletons have joints so every skeleton we ever analyse we're always looking for evidence of joint disease. Uh, so what happens is the cartilage that covers the bone uh, degenerates the bone then can come into contact with uh, the other half of the joint and I don't know if you can see but you get this very highly polished very shiny surface as the bone starts to wear away against uh, the opposite side and you also get these little holes forming the porosity and you can get bone forming up around the margins uh, so this is the an elbow joint so this is from the left arm uh, so that would have uh, affected their their left elbow but obviously joint disease can happen in any joint in the skeleton so this is one of the reasons why you need to be able to identify what you're looking at and be able to recognize each each bone to make sure you're recording uh, the information you cannot substitute the first hand you know the actual having bones in front of you and, and looking at them and seeing the variation that you yeah. get. I mean, that is the important thing. We have a large collection of human remains. We have all the equipment, we have lots of casts, but you do need to see the individual variation. Every person is an individual. Every skeleton looks different. And it's these subtle differences we are trying to investigate because obviously this will tell us about past people's lives. So if you want to find out more about what we're doing, please do have a look at the departmental website. Also the course has its own website. Do contact us to arrange a visit. We are very, very welcome to come, we show you around the lab, talk to us. It's very important that you know what you get yourself into. Yes, I think it's important to visit Durham as well, just to make sure that you know that you're happy with with the place where you'll be spending um, a year of your life. So it's a very intensive course if you come to do the MSc. Um, so you need to be comfortable in the place and happy that you've chosen the best uh, course for you.